Well, good morning. I uh, pausing for a moment to allow Braden and Samuel to uh, hand out the outline for today. And by the way, those are located in the, the rack back there in the foyer if you want to grab one on the way in and, uh, as you come to services. Uh, but we'll, uh, we'll still pass them out too if, in case you forget. But it's good to be here with you this morning. I appreciate uh, everyone being here. Uh, it's good to always be together with uh, brothers and sisters in Christ to worship. If you don't have your Bibles open already to the passage that was just read, we're uh, going to be looking at this idea that's found there in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Peter is um, writing to Christians there, of course, and telling them uh, that they are a chosen race. They are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. They are a now a special possession of God. And because of this great privilege of being uh, uh, this, this uh, special people of God, he urges them to be a little different. And he, asked, uh, he tells them there that they should act uh, like uh, a special people and to abstain from the fleshly lusts uh, that wage war against the soul. Now, as he said this, and we read these verses, he could have very easily just stopped right there and just encouraged them with uh, those words only. Um, but I think there's more to his point here uh, and that's what I want to talk about uh, this morning. He adds the phrase to that statement as he says to abstain from these fleshly lusts. He adds the phrase uh, to do that as aliens and strangers or uh, your particular version may say strangers and pilgrims or sojourners and exiles. Uh, just depends on what you're reading there but the idea is the same and the idea is uh, no matter what word you use here um, uh, that uh, we're going to talk about being a pilgrim. That's the one I'm going to use this morning, is the word pilgrim. Um, and that's what we want to talk about. And what, we're, what, what we mean by that, what that word means there in that passage, is uh, that it is a, someone who is a foreigner. It is uh, one who uh, lives in a place uh, without the right of citizenship or uh, maybe a temporary resident uh, is, is the idea. One who does not consider... Uh, his place uh, as one of permanent habitation is how one person defined it. Or perhaps my favorite is this, uh, that it is a traveler who dwells in a place for a time. And if you look in verse, uh, chapters 1 and 2 of First Peter, uh, he had reminded them earlier that they had been born again into this new life that they should now work diligently to put away certain sins like malice and deceit and hypocrisy and things that he mentions there specifically as they grow into this image of Jesus. And he tells them in the beginning of chapter 2 that they should desire the true milk of the word um, so that they can again grow in the image of Jesus and grow into a valuable and productive member of God's family. And so in these verses, Peter's instructing them, um, <clears throat> he's instructing them that uh, to avoid these harmful fleshly lusts that can condemn their soul and to do so with the mentality of a pilgrim. Well, Paul, what does that mean? <laughs> well, what does that mean? What does it mean to be a pilgrim? Uh, why is this important to us? As my goal this morning is to simply encourage all of us to develop the perspective that I think that we should all have. I think this is the way um, that God expects us to approach our lives here on earth. And a few weeks ago, Rob uh, touched on this idea as he wrote an article that we send out every week on 1 Peter chapter 2, on this exact passage. And so I don't want to be too repetitious, but I want to expand on that uh, a little bit this morning. And so the main question that I want to pose to you this morning is this. Are you a pilgrim? Are you a tourist? Or are you a citizen? Really, that's what I want to look at today. What's a tourist? <laughs> I think we all kind of have an idea, right? We've all been a tourist at one point in our lives. Uh, it is a tourist, uh, is a person that um, uh, visits a place for the purpose of pleasure, right? Uh, we make 
Uh, we've all been there. We, we make plans well in advance. We save money. We, we book our flights. We uh, book our accommodations and, 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 and do all this stuff uh, to go somewhere uh, with the intention of having fun. Uh, we, 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 we plan for vacations. We're going to go. We're going to have fun. We're going to enjoy ourselves. We're uh, perhaps maybe relax. That's your style to do absolutely nothing while you're there, and that's fine. Uh, or perhaps uh, you're going to go somewhere to experience some things that maybe you've never experienced before. And while you're on vacation, as a tourist, you, you kind of, in a sense, live it up, right? I'm not talking about going to extremes and sinful extremes by any means. I don't mean that. But you, you kind of live it up. You are uh, making the best of your time. You're having fun. It is a time that is filled uh, with pleasure, and that's the intent. And typically, while we're a tourist on vacation, we might even buy souvenirs, right? We might even buy a souvenir that helps serve as, as a reminder to us of the great time that we had. And in a sense, the purpose behind buying that souvenir is that we don't want to let go of those feelings that we had as a tourist for that week, right? And so again, the purpose of a tourist is to absorb as much pleasure and fun as possible before we go back to our real lives. Now, what about this idea of being a citizen? Or we might say a permanent resident um, is the idea. We think we have a good understanding as well of what that means. It's somebody, by definition, who is legally recognized subject of a state and is entitled to certain privileges. It's someone who is a member of a state or a nation who owes uh, and gives allegiance to its government and is entitled to its protection. And that's the key that I want to focus on with this particular definition. This person is established and there is a sense of permanency associated with being a citizen. Their allegiance is given to a nation in which they reside, and there is loyalty involved, and uh, this is important to them, and, and it means something, all right? That's a tourist, and that's a citizen, and now that we have defined both of those, I want you to consider those in contrast to this idea and what it means to be a pilgrim or a sojourner or exile, stranger, whatever word you may choose. What we really mean is, is that a pilgrim has the attitude that we are just passing through this short life while we have on earth. There, there is a, a recognition that we're really just on a journey, that we're not looking to, to set roots down here and place roots at all. That, that's not the idea. Uh, it's not approaching this life like a tourist might approach a vacation where we're focused on pleasure and fun and kicking back and doing absolutely nothing. We're not, we're not to approach this life uh, by collecting souvenirs so that we don't forget the experiences of this life. And what I mean is, is that we're not looking to tightly hold on to the feelings that are associated with this life. It's almost as if we, we're white-knuckling <laughs> this life and reluctantly letting go as we approach our death. That's not the idea at all. And, and it's also not living as if this is our permanent residency. We shouldn't live our life that demonstrates loyalty to the world. Our priority is not storing up treasures on earth. It's not acting like this is the most important thing. In other words, the pilgrim mindset is that we're not going to get overly involved with the cares and concerns of this world because our focus is on something better. Our focus is on something permanent, something eternal. We're focusing on our true home and that being heaven. Look at me, uh, uh, with me, if you will, in Hebrews chapter 11. Will you turn there for a moment? Hebrews chapter 11 there is a number of heroes of faith that are mentioned here, but I want you to notice a few specifically this morning. It says that uh, these people, uh, there's a bunch of them that are mentioned, and some of them named specifically, and some of them obviously unnamed towards the end of the chapter. But it says that all of these people died uh, in, in faith. They saw the promises of God from afar off, and they knew. They knew that this earth was not their place of permanent residency. They had the right perspective. 
I want you to look at Noah really quick in verse 7. We know the story of Noah. I think we're pretty familiar with that. Um, that he, of course, was warned by God about things that had not yet been seen. Uh, and he believed in the deliverance that was promised to him and his family. Look at Abram in verse 8 through 10. He moved to a place, as we know the story back from Genesis, that he moved to a place that he'd never seen before. And he did it exactly as God said. But he believed in the promise of God. And notice what it says about him in verse 10. This is very interesting to me. That says that Abraham was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Now, friends, this is, this is a perspective that goes way back from the book of Genesis in the beginning, the early writings. But yet Abraham that, had that kind of perspective. Before all of the law was revealed and the New Testament law, all the stuff was revealed and the mystery made known, Abraham had that kind of perspective. And then we have Moses in verses 24 through 29 that we've talked about, uh, I believe, last week. But it says specifically in verse 26 that Moses had the perspective as he was looking to the reward. You see, all of these people understood this attitude of being a pilgrim on earth. And so when you develop that mindset, when you have this attitude of being a pilgrim, then people will see that demonstrated in your life. Your life is going to exude this idea that this world is not my home, as we sung about a minute ago. It, 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 your life is going to, to make a statement almost that this is not what it's all about and you have something better to look forward to. Look in Hebrews 11, verses 13 through 16. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles or pilgrims on the earth. Skip down to verse 16. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. Notice these people were described as strangers and pilgrims in verse 13. They had the mindset that they were excited about what God had in store for them, even though they didn't fully understand what it was yet. And in verse 16... It says that their desire was for a better country, that is a heavenly one. And because of that mindset that they had, it says what? That God is not ashamed to be called their God. And do you think that this mindset's important? I think it is to God. I think it is to God. Here's the hard truth, though. We all, and I should have put a mirror here, we all get way too wrapped up in this world. We all get consumed by things in this life that really don't matter. And we forget this perspective. We lose this perspective and we forget that this life is just temporary. We get so passionate about some things sometimes. And I, I am, I'm just as guilty of this as anybody here this morning. We will spend more time and energy on things like improving our financial situation. More hours than we care to admit are related to uh, finances, whether it be paying bills or racking up new ones because we want something else, uh, or uh, uh, career moves or strategizing uh, our investments uh, or whatever the case may be. We, we get so wrapped up in this stuff. And I ran across a funny illustration that helps make our point. Listen to this. Uh, you have to kind of bear with me a, a, a bit here, but the story is this. It's told about a man who found out that it was time to go to heaven, and he asked the Lord if he could bring just one thing with him. A and the Lord said no. And he finally, after many requests, I guess, the Lord said, okay, you can bring one thing. Bring one thing with you. And so happily, the man got a suitcase, and he packed it full of gold. And he packs it full of gold, and he arrives in heaven, and the angels say, uh, well, I'm sorry, you can't bring that in here. And he said, well, the Lord said that I could. And he said, they said, okay, by the way, what's in your suitcase? And so he 
opens it up and shows them, and they said, oh, it's pavement. <laughs> Funny story, right? I have a little liberty there, but it makes the point. It makes the point. Friends, the things on earth don't matter. They, they just don't matter. We get so passionate about things. We get passionate about politics. We read a post on Facebook, and we disagree with it, and so we're quick to fire off our opinion, and they fire back, and it's back and forth and back and forth, and gets into this heated debate and discussion. And guess what? You accomplish nothing. Nothing. You just don't. We find ourselves being, in essence, an activist for causes uh, that, in the grand scheme of things, again, just don't matter. Here's an idea. How about we all be an activist for Jesus? Folks, I'm not saying these things aren't important. I, I, we, matter of fact, Carl and I and Samuel and, we were, and Taylor, we were talking a little bit about politics stuff last night. Um, not, it wasn't a heated debate, by the way, so don't get that idea. But, it, it, again, I'm not saying some of these things aren't important. All right? Um, when, uh, we, matter of fact, even Randy, uh, Wednesday night, we had a good discussion. You brought up some good thoughts uh, Wednesday on where do we draw the line when it comes uh, 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 to standing against sin in the world, right? Where, wh how far do we go? And, and that was a good discussion. How do we handle the, the homosexual issue that just seems to be so prevalent nowadays? Um, and, 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 or uh, what about the abortion issue? Or what about uh, child abuse and human trafficking and things like that? All, all of those things, you know, are important. Should we, should we make a stand against these things? and share what the Bible says about these things when we have the opportunity, of course, with the right attitude and the right setting, of course. But let's keep the proper perspective. There are a lot of lost souls out there that need the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we need to remember that we have a limited time while we're here on earth to do good. We are on a journey. We are a pilgrim. We are on our way to our eternal home. And when you're on a journey and you have the pilgrim mentality, you only take along what you need. You're not going to burden yourself down with uh, a bunch of things that you don't need because it's going to slow you down. It's going to make your journey even more difficult. I mean, are you like me, guys? Have you ever struggled with getting all of your family's luggage in the trunk of the car, and you look and go, guys, it's an overnight trip, right? I'm not alone in that, am I? Tell me I'm not. But, but you see, and we do that in life sometimes. We get so distracted with this life, what it has to offer, and, and we accumulate more and more baggage, and that baggage just becomes a burden it becomes a distraction and we can't maneuver through this journey uh, on earth as effectively as we could because of all of that it becomes heavy it, it slows us down our, our attention inevitably goes and gets directed towards this baggage uh, rather than focusing on our ultimate destination where we're going and unfortunately because of that distraction sometimes it's going to cause us to get off course and we get lost and that's when we need to stop Guys, I know, but we need to stop sometimes and ask directions. And we need to look into uh, the roadmap that God has provided us. Dig into His Word, get back on course, pray to Him so that we can get through this journey of life. Let's not act like tourists and permanent residents of earth, but let's have a better understanding, a better perspective of the fact that I'm a Christian. I, I am a pilgrim. I am on a journey on my way to my true home. It's not here. It's heaven. Let's talk about heaven for a moment. You ever been on vacation to where the first part of the week you're just so excited and caught up in the sights and the scenes of wherever you are, and it's, it's fun, it's great, and, and it's all new, and you're just so happy to get away from real life for a little bit. And, 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 but then as the week wears on, what happens? What happens? You start longing for home a little bit, don't you? You start longing for home. You start thinking about maybe some family that was left back home that wasn't able to make the trip, or um, maybe you're missing pets or maybe you're missing your own bed or whatever the case is and your mind begins to think you know I, I can't wait to get back home 
how many of you have said this? You come back from vacation, and they're, you're tell, talking to somebody about your trip, and, and uh, they say, you know, look, I, it was a great time. We had a great time, but it's, it's just good to be home. Who said that? Right? We've all said that. It's just good to be home. Here's the question. Do we feel that way about heaven? Do we feel that way about heaven? What, what makes heaven so great after all? Turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, uh, read with me verses 36 and 37 for just a moment. John 13, 36 through 37. Here is um, Peter and Jesus having a conversation, and Peter says to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. And Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay my life down for you. Now we're going to read the whole story in the context, but I, we, we have the entire New Testament, obviously, and we know that this statement that Peter makes is not exactly true because we know what happens a little bit later. But that's not what's important. The, what's important here is I want to focus on the tone of what Peter is saying. Listen to the tone of what he is saying in his, his, his question to Jesus. Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I, I will lay my life down for you. He, in essence, is saying this. Lord, I can't live without you. I can't live without you. And the greatest thing we need to see in the New Testament, especially the Gospels, is that these people, that the men and women in the time of Jesus that were there, the greatest thing to them was His presence. It was His presence. They wanted to be with Him. They wanted to spend time with Him as much as they could. And Jesus' response to, to Peter here was, well, you can't go with me right now, but you can later. Now, go to John 14. In John 14, the first six verses, Jesus is talking about the preparations that He's going to go and make so that He can come and join Him later. And there's an invitation to join Him later. And He says that you can get there through Jesus. You can get there through me, He says, and so we have to familiarize ourselves with His will and surrender to it, obey it, live it in order to get through Jesus to get home. Well, some may say, well, you know, what, what, if, I don't, what if I don't know Him? Well, what if I don't know Him? What, what if I haven't spent any time in getting acquainted with Him? What if, what if I have seen clearly His steps there, but I, I just haven't followed them? I've refused to go that way. Or what if maybe He's called me and I said, no, not, not right now, I'm not coming. What, what if I've been so busy in life uh, and so occupied with activities and concerns that I haven't had the time to sit down and to really listen to him, as we talked about in class this morning, I sit down and talk to him and to listen to him and to read his word? Well, I would say that sounds like a pretty serious problem. Because John chapter 17 and verse 3 says that eternal life comes through knowing the Father. Does that sound familiar? knowing the Father. We must know Jesus. We must know God. It's not some sort of casual acquaintance. It's knowing Him in the sense that we've studied this year. It's having a relationship with Him. It is being in fellowship with Him. It's not just coming to services and making an appearance and then leaving in the same condition in which you arrived. Not changed at all. It's not taking a few notes and filling in the blanks on the outlines that we handed out a few minutes ago. It's not having this attitude of, well, you know, as we leave here this morning, well, hey, all right, I don't have to worry about Jesus till next week. It's not that at all. We have to desire to be with Him, just like Peter. The attitude of, Lord, I can't live without you. That's the way that we should be towards God. You know, when you think about where you grow up, um, maybe you think of that as, as home. I, I don't know. Everybody has a different place they consider home. Maybe it might be somewhere else. Maybe where you've raised your own children um, or something. I, I don't know. Where, wherever, wherever it is. But when you think about home, why does that conjure up these ideas that are so positive? Why does it conjure up some good emotions what is it that you think about now granted there might be some physical things that are involved there uh, that that make you happy bring up happy thoughts like maybe a rocking chair on a front porch 
um, maybe a, a fireplace uh, that you, you know, sat by, maybe a, a comfortable bed that you slept in, or maybe it was a kitchen to where you made cookies with grandma, or maybe it's a tree in the backyard with a tire swing on it, whatever, right? Wh- whatever it may be, fill in the blank. There might be some physical things that you think about when you think about home. But when you think about home, do you know what really makes it home? What really makes that feel like home to you is because of who is there. It's because who is there. It's the loved ones that are home. And so when we think about our heavenly home, I'm not going to get caught up in the streets of gold and the pearly gates and all of this other stuff and other descriptions that we find in the book of Revelation. I'm not going to get wide-eyed about the accommodations and how great everything sounds, but rather the fact that God is there. God is there. Jesus is there. I want to be in His presence. I, I, I don't know about all the details. I don't know what I'm going to be doing for eternity. I don't know what He's got planned for me. It doesn't matter. I just know that God planned it, and that's good enough for me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18, it says that Jesus rose again, that He's coming back, and those uh, that are faithful are going to be with the Lord forever. The comfort is found in what? That those who have died in with Jesus will be with the Lord always not enjoying the streets of gold but the emphasis is on the relationship it's more about the person than it is the place we will be with God and that's what really matters again I don't care what I'm going to be doing it doesn't matter to me I'm just going to be with my heavenly father that's our true home that's our true home that's where our father is and so let's not get distracted Uh, with things in this life and makes us lose sight of that very quickly I want to make four suggestions to you this morning that help us in maintaining this attitude of being a pilgrim and the first one is this Philippians chapter 3 verses 17 through 21 Um, read that with me Philippians 3 17 through 21 the apostle Paul says brethren join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us For many walk, of whom I often told you, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into the conformity with the body of His glory, by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. These people here were doing whatever they desired. Their God, their, their focus was their own appetites. They did whatever they hungered for. And Paul says that their minds were on earthly things. They, they had a heart problem. They, they had an issue. And he categorizes them as being enemies of the cross of Christ. And, and he says that we can't, we can't think that way. As Christians, as children of God, we can't think that way because our citizenship is in heaven. We should be thinking about spiritually things. He says we should be spiritually minded people. And as we said this morning in class, as a little prelude that kind of came up in a comment, here's the point. Just because we're baptized into Christ doesn't make us spiritually minded. Because the fact of the matter is is that there are worldly minded Christians. In Colossians chapter 3, in verses 1 through 4, Paul's talking to baptized believers there, and he says, set your mind on things above. We're talking about heavenly things, spiritual things, not on the things of earth. Why? Because they're a distraction. They're not important. They're not going to help you on your journey to your eternal home. And Paul, again, is saying we should be spiritually minded. Well, what does that mean exactly? Well, think of it this way. When you have some idle time, where does your mind naturally drift to? And maybe that idle time is driving. Maybe it's in the shower or quiet time after the kids go to bed or wherever the case is. But where does your mind go to? What do you find yourself talking about the most? Because the the truth of the matter is, is we talk about the things that are important to us. Those are the things that are in our heart. A a spiritually minded person is going to consistently think about their relationship with God. What are the areas of weakness that I have? Where are areas that I can improve in my relationship with God? 
How can, how can I do better in some areas? Or how can, maybe looking even externally, how, how can I um, help brother so-and-so? How, how can I encourage someone else? Or how can, how can I improve maybe in the area of hospitality that I can invite over and get to know them better at my place? Or uh, ways that I can serve or whatever the case may be. Or, or maybe it might be, how did I fail to be a light today? That's what a spiritually minded person does. But on the other hand, ones that earthly minded or fleshly minded is consumed with money and hobbies and job related stuff and the next movie that's coming out and all this good stuff. And again, look, I'm not saying those are necessarily bad things, but those are, that's not what it's all about. And so setting our minds on things above means that we look at things in this life through a lens of spirituality. As we make decisions we have to prioritize our service to God. For example, as we consider career choices, where we're going to live, who we might date, who we might eventually marry, uh, uh, how am I going to spend my time and money, we look at that through the lens of spirituality and we ask ourselves, well, how is this decision going to affect my ability to worship with the saints on a regular basis? How is this particular decision going to affect the, the, the time that I can spend in, in Bible study? Or, uh, in, in, or is it going to negatively affect my relationship with my wife and children? Or uh, whatever the case might be. That, that's what that means. Or, on the other hand, ignoring the lens of spirituality, we just look at things from the standpoint of, okay, how is this going to make me look? What are others going to think of me? How am I going to be able to be um, uh, cool and accepted and, 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 and um, things of that nature? Or, or falling into the trap of, uh, of keeping up with the Joneses or you know, whatever the case is, right? We get the idea. Here's the point. Satan is going to tempt you and he is going to urge you, you can count on it, to do things that have a negative impact on your spiritual life and to cause you to lose focus on your eternal destination. He's just going to do it. And we've got to be aware of that. Romans chapter 8, verse 5 through 8, Paul says that you can't please God if you're fleshly minded. You just can't do it. That's how serious it is. We can't do it. In that passage right there, we have two choices. We can be spiritually minded and have life and peace or we can be fleshly minded, which leads to hostility towards God, which, which does not please Him and ultimately leads to death. That's our choices. And so we just get caught up in stuff of life way too often, and I just can't be pleasing to God that way. Secondly, let me suggest to you that we, as the passage said we read earlier, abstain from fleshly lusts. In 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, we see that giving in to these lusts is going to damage our soul. It, it's going to hinder our journey home. It's going to throw us off course. We can't experiment with sin and, and think, you know, I'm going to dip my toe in this experience uh, with things, and then I'll come back to God later. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. It, it, the Bible tells us that if we approach it that way with this experimental attitude, it's incompatible with being spiritually minded. The Bible says it wars against the soul. Listen, Satan again, he, he is the best marketing guy out there. He is. <laughs> he, he is good at what he does. He's going to present things as liberating. He's going to present them as so exciting. And, and you need to try this. And you need this. And, and you need to do this. And, and, and you deserve this. This is what it's all about. But let's be real for a moment. Let's, let's admit to each other that sin is enslaving and some of that can be very addictive. The truth is, is that, you know what, we're all wired differently. I don't know if you've thought about this or not, but we're all wired differently and some of us are more susceptible to addictive behavior than others. And so you don't need to be messing around and trying things because that might turn out to be a disaster. Romans 12 verse 9 says to abhor that which is evil. To utterly detest is what that means. To, to have a horror for. I don't want anything to do with that. Stay away from that as far as possible. Don't develop a taste or an appetite for it. And young people, let me say this really quick. And I say young people, I'm including my own kids. Don't dip your toe in uh, trying something as, as a young person, as a teenager, 
because you might look up as a 40 and 50 year old adult and realize that you're still battling the same exact thing okay we have to be careful Christians need to exhibit self-control and abstain from these fleshly things that surround us on our journey home now if you if you look at it this way we have this road that we're traveling, this traveling towards our eternal home, and I think Satan puts these billboards along the side of the road to advertise certain things to get us to take that detour, take that exit, get us off track. And so we have to be careful. Stay focused. One of the great passages to me, I, I've heard Paul say this many times too, best, the best passage, one of the best, is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 13. What a great promise. There is nothing you will face that you can't get out of. God's going to provide a way of escape. He's going to give you the ability to resist that temptation. Everything we face, we can get out. Romans 13 and verse 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, make no provision for the flesh in regards to lust. God's telling us all of this is incompatible with me. Let's stay focused on Him. Thirdly, really quick, we need to glorify God with our good works. And there's a bunch of passages here. We're not going to read all those. Uh, but they all speak to our action portion of our faith, our, our God-given perf- purpose of doing good works. And so the question is, are you doing that? Are you engaging in good deeds? And again, to clarify, I, I'm not suggesting that you're going to go do these things and earn your salvation and, and get your punch card all filled up in order for you to get, to get in. And look what I did, right? That's not the idea at all. But if our hearts are aligned with Jesus, if we're following Him because we love Him, we love His way, then we're going to desire to demonstrate that love to others by doing good works, again, for the purpose of glorifying Him. I make this point in the context of perspective on this life because if we're focused on doing good in the kingdom of God, we're not going to have time to be distracted by other things so the question is are you diligently working for God is your life characterized by service what do your children see in you do they see you with a life of service and looking to serve others or do they see you as the one always looking to be the recipient looking for others to serve you We need to be on alert for opportunities to help others and not be naive about the ones that exist among our own brethren. And fourthly, again, um, as we we try to four suggestions here on developing this mindset of being a pilgrim, here's a tough one. We need to have the mindset of a pilgrim by not having a fear of death. If you're still in Philippians, look at verse chapter 1 and verse 19 through 23 and for the sake of time let's pick up in the last part of verse 20 Christ will even now as always here listen to Paul be exalted in my body whether by life or by death for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain but if I am to live on in the flesh this will mean fruitful labor for me And I don't know which to choose. But I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. As you read these verses, I want to ask you a question. Do you hear any hint of fear in Paul's voice at all? Any hint of fear at all? I don't. Is there anything that indicates that he's dreading death? or that there's any cause for concern about this earthly life ending? I I don't hear that at all. The question is, do we feel that way? And and I think, again, as I said, this is the tough one, right? I think this is where the rubber meets the road, to be honest. Uh, uh, But a true pilgrim, a true pilgrim feels this, knowing that I'm going to have to go through death in order to get to where I want to go, unless you happen to be alive when Jesus comes back. And I think the hard truth is, is that if we don't feel this way, then we might be, we might be a little too earthly minded. Listen, it's hard for us as humans to have this mindset. I, I, I get it. But in order to have our heart truly be what God wants us to be, 
We've got to be spiritually minded and pleasing to Him. This is what we have to have. And, and when we lose a loved one, when we lose a, a friend perhaps that passes away, we comfort ourselves with the thought, and we even verbalize this sometimes, that, well, he or she is, is now receiving their reward, and they're not suffering anymore, and they're at peace, and things of that nature. And, and, and that, that's good. And the thought is, of course, that, yes, do we miss them? Yeah, of course we do. But now they're reaping the reward of fighting the good fight of faith. And we're excited for them and we're happy for them that now uh, that they are able uh, to, to, to receive their reward. But here's the question. And again, this is where the rubber meets the road. What about when it comes to us? What, what, how do we look at ourselves? What are we saying to ourselves? Do we have the same mindset and the same attitude? Do we have the mindset of Paul that says, sure, I have work to do here for the Lord. I have work to do, but I also look forward to being with Him in heaven. Or do we, do we anxiously await going home? Or do we hold on to this life and prioritize it? Friends, I just want to say, don't fear death. Because death represents the end of our pilgrimage and the beginning of our eternal reward. That's the right perspective. And all the things that we've talked about here today, I, I, again, I'm not claiming that I've mastered these at all. I, I, I haven't. I haven't. Nor do I expect that any of you have either. But these are good, wise, biblical things that we need to consider and work on. And as we all grow together with our walk and our walk with Christ, let's, let's work on having the right perspective on this life. Let's live like a pilgrim. Let's, let's just be passing through on our journey home to our Heavenly Father. Open your books to 457. That's the song we're going to sing here in just a second. And I want you to read with me the lyrics of this song in light of what we just talked about before we sing it. This is powerful stuff right here. And I want you to read what we are about to sing to each other and to God. Walking alone at eve and viewing the skies afar, Bidding the darkness to come and welcome each silver star, I have a great delight in the wonderful scenes above. God in His power and might is showing His truth and love. Sitting alone at eve and dreaming the hours away, watching the shadows falling now at the close of day, God in His mercy comes with His word He is drawing near, spreading His love and truth around me and everywhere. Listen to the third verse. Closing my eyes at eve and thinking of heaven's grace, longing to see my Lord, yes, meeting Him face to face, trusting Him as my all, wheresoever my footsteps roam, pleading with Him to guide me on to the Spirit's home. Oh, for a home with God, a place in His courts to rest, sure in a safe abode with Jesus and the blessed. Rest for a weary soul, once redeemed by the Savior's love, where I'll be pure and whole and live with my God above. You know what the truth is? We're all going somewhere. This world's not our home. The question is, where are you going? Where are you going? If you need to make your life right so that you're assured of a heavenly home, we ask you to make that known as we stand up and sing.